Okay, well, good morning to those of you in the morning areas and, and good afternoon or good evening to those of us in different parts of the world. Thank you, Maha, this is really exciting. We're gonna do this as a live experiment. Uh, Maha is now in Egypt, in uh, Cairo, and I'm currently on the other side of the world in Malaysia. Uh, but this backdrop that I have, this is actually from Egypt when I was there in Cairo just a few months ago. It's a very mystic place, very wonderful place, but that's not why we're here today. We're here today because Maha is going to recite a really powerful poem. I mean, when I heard this poem, my goosebumps went up and I actually started crying because it was just so powerful. And I think this is going to be a wonderful experience that's experimental for us too, the both of us, and for all of the audience who will uh, invest a little bit of time to hear this poem. I think it will bring energy and empowerment and bravery. Uh, so Maha, with your permission, I'm gonna actually share my screen because I have, um, I pulled up the, uh, this is the uh, poem that you uh, wrote. However, I want to start with an image about being brave. So this is, this is something that I wrote. It was actually extracted from a technical report. Uh, however, um, when you make something into an artistic meme or a diagram, it doesn't look like a technical report. So I'm gonna just read this. What does being brave mean? So being brave helps me face VUCA, you know, volatile, uncertain, and all of that. But when I am brave, I dare to be accountable. I am human and sometimes fail to be brave. But I become brave in my role as mother, daughter, leader, teacher, trusted friend. Becoming brave was an accidental yet conscious, arduous yet beautiful journey over a lifetime. Now that I know how to be brave for myself, I must help others find their own path to become brave too. And so that's what you're doing today, Maha. You're going to share with us, how did it feel like on that day when you wrote that poem? It is so powerful. And what I invite you to do is remember the feeling that you had when you wrote that poem. Yeah. If you need to close your eyes, pause. I will keep quiet when it's time for you to record your voice doing the poem. You may take a few seconds or, or more to pause and bring yourself back to that moment. Remember the incidences that made you write that poem. Be brave to revisit it. It might hurt. Um, it's okay. This is an experiment and, and we're here uh, to, to support you on that. And then when you're in that moment, if your mind wanders and if you remember, oh, I wrote it, but then after that, I got over it. At that moment, I invite you again to be brave and with gratitude for your own situation. Think about other people who could not write that poem, who that poem represents, whom you are now eloquently sharing the poem on their behalf because you can. So I invite you to have that mindset when you read your poem. And you just let me know when you're ready and I will just Keep quiet and spotlight you so that we can hear you and see you. Um, and it's okay if it takes a long time to go through the poem. It'll be you. Yes, thank you so much, Rose. And yeah, I, I am thinking about the situations that led to this poem. I'm not gonna say what they are right now. We could say later, by the way, because it's a recurring thing, but it was a moment that it all just came to a head and I had to express myself. And the reason I ended up writing the poem is that Sherry Spielitz has, uh, some people will know her on Twitter as Edified Listener. Um, she has an identity education and power magazine published on Medium. And she had invited me to write something for her and I didn't know what to write. And then when I had these feelings, I when I'm angry or upset, 
that or very emotional I write poetry and that was what I had written that day and I'm like hey that could Sherry would be okay to take a poem instead of an article and she's like yeah sure this is what it is um so I'm gonna it's start beautiful I, I I can't <laughs> wait to hear your voice um recite it because I read it in silence in my yeah. in my own head but yeah. I could hear your voice and I, I yeah. I'm dying to hear it now so so the fact that I'm reading it with you uh knowing that that would never be a poem I would address to you <laughs> when, oh. when people listen they will know I would not be talking to to Rose about this there there are other people who will know that so the poem is called I'm not angry at you so I invite people who will recognize that this poem is addressed to them to remember that the title is I'm not angry at you because it, there's a lot of anger in this poem but it's not directed at you so I hope people will take that for what, what it is. Okay, I'm not angry at you. I'm not angry at you just because your government, your people, at some point in history, enslaved people from my continent, displaced and dispersed and abused them because you weren't there. You didn't do it yourself. I'm not angry at you just because your government then freed them, thinking they were doing them a damn favor then continue to treat them as less than human, as less than citizens, as less, as less to this day, as less. I'm not angry at you just because your government, your people at some point in history colonized my land, violated my land, violated my history, stole my history, crushed my culture, violated my people, shamed them because it's not your fault. You weren't there. I'm not angry at you just because your language and knowledge are dominant to the extent that they almost erase mine. At least I count myself lucky that I can communicate in the world. At least I am privileged to have a voice. I'm not angry at you because my exoticism attracts you. It's normal in ignorance. It's normal in novelty. At least you're looking, you're listening, and someday the exoticism will fall away and you will see the human in me. But I'll tell you what makes me angry. When one of my people commits a crime, and you generalize it to us all when the weakness of my people seek ref weakest of my people seek refuge in your land and you vote to refuse them when those very people are people whose land and what's in it you stole without permission for years when you could have helped with their plight but instead you repeatedly violated you repeatedly voted to make their plight worse and then you i'll tell you what makes me angry I'm angry when I tell you my story in your own damn language and you change it. You think you know better. You don't think you can express it better. You can't. That's you. I'll tell you what makes me angry when I so carefully choose my allies and you from your haughty distance presume to know, to judge my story and tell me I can't see colonialism at work. You who have never been colonized telling me that I don't know what colonialism looks like? Are you kidding me? What makes me angry is you calling yourself my friend for years, then supporting someone else, colonizing, bullying me, supporting their right to free speech, bullying those who support me. Even if I were black, they would be called racist. If I were Jewish, they would be called anti-Semitic. I were gay, they would be called homophobic. But you call them none of those things. Which there isn't the right buzzword for it because it really isn't Islamophobia because it has nothing to do with Islam because it's a white man abusing a post-colonial woman and there's no word for what that's called because it is beyond sexism it's not that a white person can never critique a non-white person we're all people we all make mistakes It's not that a white person can never critique a non-white person, we're all people, we all make mistakes, but it's that a white person cannot possibly understand experiences of racism or post-colonialism, cannot possibly understand it better than the people experiencing, experiencing it. Do not shake your head. It's not possible. No one should feel guilty because they were born white, just as no one should feel guilty because they were born brown. But every day you have a responsibility to speak out against injustice, to question your own actions, to consider your own words, and if you don't know how to make it right, I suggest you shut up or you'll just make me more angry. That's it. I had to pause the recording because I was blubbering. <laughs> so.
Um, and I'm back. That was beautiful, Maha. That was really, I've got my, my little <laughs> face towel here. Um, it, it's very powerful. And Thank you so much. I can tell you spoke from the heart. Yeah. And it was, it was written to a friend, you know? And, you know, even though you said it's not addressed to me or not addressed to anybody, I think if we were to be brave and to really think about the concepts behind what you were saying, I think every one of us, because we're human, we, we also fall prey to, to being prejudiced in one way or another. And even if my skin is browned, I know for a fact that I also grew up with prejudice and it's only maybe in recent adulthood years where uh, being a parent and being responsible for nurturing our next generation down and being an educator, having nurtured so many students in, in, in uh, throughout our career, we are still guilty also of similar injustices because we are trained to be discerning. You know, as yes. an educator, we it's our job to do assessment all the time. And so a lot of times, whatever things that we assess people based on, it's a very thin line between judgment and assessment. Yeah. It's a very thin was, line. Yeah, my students and I were, uh, were watching a video that I play every year uh, by a British psychologist called Binna Kandola, so of Indian origin, right? You can tell from his name. And he says the world has two types of people, people who are biased and people who don't know that they're biased. And so That's everybody's biased, but it's just whether you know or you don't know. And obviously the people who don't know that they're biased or don't believe that they're biased are more problematic. Like the important thing is to be aware of what kind of biases we have and, and just reflect on that and try to make it not affect the way we treat people and try to adjust that all the time. But no matter how self-aware you are and how diverse your network is and how much intercultural maturity you have, there will, you will always come across categories of people that you've never met before or individuals that don't fit your historical knowledge of a certain group of people right from before and how we behave and how we treat them and how we could more importantly than it's, I mean, they, my students were like, oh, well, so if everybody has bias, it's okay. I'm like, no, it's not okay because you can actually harm people by the way you're biased. And of course, yes, in education, this is so important. One of the things in education that I always worry about is what if someone is doing a presentation and they're very presentable and very eloquent, but the content of what they're saying is not so great. And because of someone else who doesn't have a very good accent or is a little bit nervous but their content is very good they get judged as less and those things are are so important um, yeah. but of course in the bigger world the way you know we're, we always talk about this right african americans are more likely to get arrested in the first place for things that a lot of white people do but they just never get arrested for them and then the african americans get uh get it on their record and then if they do the second thing it's a second offense and it becomes yeah, I I totally agree with you. And, and a student, or rather a mentee, who recently I was uh, in a coaching session with, uh, asked me and said, "What do you mean you don't believe in right and wrong?" Because I I made this very bold statement. I said, "There's no such thing as right and wrong." And he's like, "How can you do that? How can you say that?" And and I went through this logical uh, progressive statements, I said, well, if everything is based on context and what knowledge that you have at the moment, there will come a time when there is really no such thing as an absolute right and an absolute wrong. It's just a matter of which context you happen to be in that you need to be in for that situation. And I think on that note, it's really powerful, your poem. And I think it's really powerful that we have decided to record this um, and share this openly because I think and I hope it will invite a lot of discussion. Um, and maybe, maybe if we're brave enough, this might be the first to a series because oh. I think this mode of sharing, yeah. it's a little bit academic, but not overly. It's yeah. definitely free flow, uh, but not unstructured. Um, so it's neither right nor wrong. 
uh, it is in itself, you know, the, the, the that in between. So on and, that and note, Rose, what, yeah. what you read at the beginning, that was you, that you, you wrote that, right? I wrote About that. Bravery? Yeah. yeah so and it was actually, th those were five bullet points from a report that I'm writing about a leadership training program for a corporation. Uh, but these were quotes that, uh, uh, or rather they were personalized outcomes uh, written in first voice. They're actually the result of the training program, but written in first voice as a, a way of describing uh, what happens when you make people have to go through something that requires being brave. Um, and, and what are the tangible outcomes that happen in the workplace? Productivity increases and you build individual capacity uh, in that person so that that person can take ownership and autonomy to become a better productive worker, as opposed to top down uh, boss telling the, the worker what they have mm. to do. This is really a very brave way of, of looking at individual development to become a building block for workplace productivity, totally different. Uh, than than what it would be in the traditional way, and so that's yeah. why I chose to to pick that excerpt and and I I put it on this background um, mm -hmm. because I remember the experience I had when I visited you in Egypt. It was very empowering for me as well, and so I think it's really meaningful uh, to to just combine all these things in an artistic, creative way. Don't you think? Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much, Rose. It's All right. Well, let's publish this and we'll invite yes. people to have a discussion on this and I'll see you Thank again you. soon. Inshallah. All right. Bye.